so if you have like you're trying to set yourself up or your child for having a regulated Mm -hmm. nervous system and let's say you had a traumatic um, pregnancy or a traumatic birth or highly medicalized which you could definitely say is traumatic as well Mm -hmm. circumcision i get berated for this but for me like that's the first time a baby is really dissociated from their body right like you have no anesthesia no nothing to numb the pain and you just literally are cutting off flesh for no reason yeah for no reason um but we pretend that there is and that's okay (laughs) um so you have all these things so even a parent that's like i'm doing all the right things like if you had any of these things you you need to consider them how how would you help to regulate your child's nervous system at a young age? Because obviously you can't give them a course or anything because they're so young. It's like, what do you do in your day-to-day practices to try to regulate that nervous system? You start with yourself. Okay. Um, it depends on the severity of the trauma. So, mm-hmm. and there's so many examples, but if a kiddo really was, um, let's see, what's an example I could use that's actually quite common. Let's say they had a surgery that was life-giving, like they had to have spinal surgery or something like that because of a ganglion or a tumor or whatever. So that little one is definitely going to have some surgical trauma from the anesthesia, from all of it, not understanding cognitively what is going on. That is where um, having some consultation with someone trained in the areas I am, namely somatic experiencing, somatic practice, which is the work of Kathy Kane and Steve Terrell and Peter Levine's higher level work, which he calls the eye of the needle, which is working with surgical anesthesia and near death experience states. They all kind of clump together. It's hard to find someone with all those specialties. We do exist. Um, let's just say you can't find that. Cause I'm going to say it's possible a person won't. That is where you, the parent, and this is why I created the courses I've created, you can do a lot of the healing with your kid, not because you're trying to treat them, but through your own regulation. So let's just say, I'll paint the scenario. Let's say a person's gone through some of my work. They know how to connect to their viscera. They know how to, um, uh, we would call it drop, but it's to help regulate and calm the kidneys and adrenals. Um, They understand uh, attunement, orienting, resourcing, how to slow their breath down, but not in a way that's dissociative, and just be in their bodies with the earth, with their baby. You can hold that baby and have the intention of their kidneys, adrenals, their gut, their brain stem, Let's say they, their spine was worked on. You know, you can put your hand on their spine. I teach in my courses how to work with the layers of the body, the skin, the fascia, the bone, the muscle, um, the marrow, and have that mother or father hold and just have the intention of those little areas. Not so much healing, it, it's safety. Mm-hmm. It's like, and also acknowledging, oh my goodness, that must have been so scary so scary. Don't say you were scared. Cause this is one thing that I think is a misnomer is a, a lot of mothers and fathers get confused when I say you shouldn't show your children emotion. They're like, what, how will they learn it? The thing is, is if they see mom or dad freaking out and really emotional and they're really young and by young, I mean, under the age of 14, mm. they think that they have to take care of you. So they'll change themselves to soothe you. So that's, so that's where it's like, you're good. Mommy's here. We're just going to talk to your muscles. We're going to talk to that bone that had to get drilled in. Oh, that must've been so hard and just feel my hand and it's safe. And the tissues hold memory. So if let's say there was something that had to pierce the spine or whatever for fluid to be tested, like you can talk to that area, Mm. right? You can use touch that lets them know I'm here oh, that, that must have been so scary being in that operating room with people with masks on and funny lights. And we're going to sit in this space with dim lights, containment, and just hold you. And so for that example, that is one way to do a lot of healing with, say, infants. Toddlers, it's a little different because they have more energy. 
but that's where play and you did that with what you said with your little one like kids will know what to do when you allow them to move out of it my husband worked with a, a, a little one who had to have brain surgery as a baby. Oof. And it's such a great story because it had to happen. Because of that story, um, she definitely had delays developmentally, sensitivities. The, the thing that was difficult is the parents really didn't understand, even though Seth did all this work with him, the mother was a bit more understanding, but the, the father just wanted, just I just want to go to a baseball game with my daughter. I'm like, dude, she can't do that. And so he would do all this work with this kid. Like kid was about eight or nine at this time. Um, and then all the work would just be thrown out of the window because he, he had that projection of this is what it is to be a dad. I want to go to a baseball game with my kid. Mm-hmm. And, and she just would blow up because it was too much. But one of the things that they worked on, Candace, is um, it was in an office setting, my old office, and we have a skeleton that hangs in the corner because of my Feldenkrais work. And she loved skeleton. She called it Mr. Skeleton. (laughs) And so he got it down and put it on the floor. And we had markers and pens and matches. And what did she want to do? She wanted to burn Mr. Skeleton's eyes out. And the mother was like, oh, and Seth's like, let her do it. It's fine. And what that was, it was her aggression, her sadistic energy coming out because she had been cut open in her brain. So even though she was a baby, this is where when people say it's in the body, it's in the, it's like, this is what this means. It isn't just in this emotional movement of catharsis. It is that deep. And so he would let her, he would, he would strike the matches, you know, and it was safe. And she'd like, like, let's burn skeletons eyes out. And they did that for a while. There was also some times where she had red markers and she would just red all over skeleton. But then the turning point came and this was over months and months and months and months where one day she came in and she wanted to clean skeleton. She wanted to bandage skeleton up. She wanted to like, pat it nicely. So that was her transitioning from, I don't need to get this sadistic energy out. I now want to help. So you see if a kid was at home with their parents and the kid says, mommy, I want to, I want to take this thing and destroy it or set it on fire. Or I want to like, my mom just brought all my Barbies over Candace. I couldn't believe she kept them like, (laughs) Oh my God. But like, if a kid wants to like pull a Barbie's leg off, you know, let them do it, stay with them, Mm -hmm. have them experience it. Um, Of course, at that age, you know, it's, they're not going to go and pull a human's leg off. It's their version of play therapy. Mm -hmm. So your question was, what can a parent do when they know these things have happened? That is more extreme, but don't underestimate the amount of interventions that our kids have gone through that we think as normal Mm. dentist having a broken arm and having it to get cast, you know, getting an x-ray vaccines, all these things, you know, anything where you're holding a kid down and they're trying to fight that is going to still be in their system. And then if you don't understand how the physiology works two days later, you could be at home and you're like, why does little Johnny keep fighting with his sister? Like he wasn't doing that. But if, if you can make those connections, oh, <laughs> teeth cleaning, we had to hold him down. And the, the dentist was a little abrupt. That's him wanting to punch the dentist in the face, not his sister. Mm. And so that's where the parent has to understand what we would call stored traumatic procedural memory. Basically, a procedural memory is anything, it's a procedure where we want to get something out, but we can't. The the easiest example, if you're walking down a soccer pitch and a ball comes to your head and you see it and you do this, right, to protect. Mm -hmm. Or a knife falls when you're cutting vegetables and you, you pull back. Now imagine, Candace, if you had your toddler at your legs when you were cooking dinner and your knife fell, Would you jump back and have it such that the toddler was under the knife? No, No. you would stop the procedure in your nervous system to protect. Mm -hmm. 
But in your nervous system, there is a written instruction that has said, jump back from that knife. Same thing. You see the, the soccer ball coming, and let's say you're holding your baby, and you can't let your baby down to protect your head, and you want to, but you can't, and you get hit. There will be a movement in your spine and your upper neck muscles that wants to get away from that, but you couldn't. So a lot of these procedural memories that get written in our physiology, in our peripheral nervous system, attaches the muscles. When we can't fight, flee, protect, do a behavior, even shout, scream, say, I don't like that. No, I don't want to hug Uncle Harry. You know, like, come on, just give him a hug. It's like, yeah, don't do that right? They will repress a part of them. And so what occurs is as we age or as we get older as kids, these things come out in behaviors. But when you understand how this works at this trauma level, at the nervous system level, you go, oh, that's that. 